praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I'm numbered. Praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water that my enemies drown in. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to pray. Because of him, though we were once lost, we are found. Though we were once blind, we can see. That's who we're celebrating today. The giver of life, the giver of grace, and as we all know, amazing grace. Just give your song to him, give your heart to him right now, and focus on his goodness. All these pieces. Sweet. 
Good morning, Point Church. I'm about to get up in this tub. I'm going to push oh. <laughs> I got a leg cramp from doing that. I was Woo! joking around. I was joking around like I was going to do it, but then I was like, no, I'll fall. I'm getting old. That's cramped I will up fall doing in there. that. I know. Cramped up. <laughs> cramped up. God bless him. Go ahead. Put your arm out like this and say, no, go, no, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> say, God bless him. Bless him, Lord. Hey, thank God you bless. online for joining in that blessing. I'll take it. <laughs> oh, well, uh, good morning. And we got an exciting two weeks. In two weeks, we've got a, a launch of a new series, and it's called The Fighter. Finder. Yes. It I'm is so a four-week series on Gideon. Yes. It's to help you find your purpose in the fight. Yes. That That's what I'm talking about. nice, right? And so it's, it, you look at the picture and you're like, oh, my gosh, they're bringing fighting to the yeah. point Yeah, Octagon up here. Octagon. Me and TC going to go at it. Oh. Give, we're going to give you an excuse to invite somebody. Those folks who you've invited, and they're like, no, thank you. I would never step foot in a church. Yo, this is going to be the same kind of vibes as Hot Ones. Remember Hot Ones? Yeah, yeah. The vibes and the lobby and all the things. We're going to make it super fun. So it's an excuse to invite somebody. We got cards out there. Grab a card and invite somebody because you know that people around us that work at school, at church, all the things are going through a thing. Oh, yeah. Trying to find a purpose. And they're going to need to hear from this uh, sermon series. They need series. to fight. They awesome. need to fight like Gideon. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, empty those bowls. Take those invite cards Please and start handing them out everywhere. Absolutely. And also, in two weeks, we have Grow Group launch. So I'm yeah, so yeah. excited to hop into our series. We're going to be diving into the study. Uh, so on Sunday, we uh, hear the message, and then through the week, the Grow Group study that content. So I'm very excited. That's in two weeks. If you haven't hopped into a group yet, we have them out on the wall. There's been some new ones added this week. So please check it out, scan the code, and hop in right meow. They're right meow. Right meow. Uh, and also, we'd like to invite TC as we have yes, a, a guest today. So Pastor TC, you if you come on out and join us, please, sir. Welcome yes. On. The floor is yours. You guys are having all the fun, so I wanted <laughs> to join in. I, I have an update that I want to share with the church. Several months ago, we shared that we were searching for our next next student pastor, right? Pastor Noah has done a great job for several years. He stepped into a new opportunity at another church, and we're so happy for him. But we also needed somebody to come in and take our student ministry to the next level. So we interviewed a lot of different candidates, and we, as of last Sunday, have hired our new student director. His name is Austin High. Welcome him and his family out on the stage. So this is Austin, this is Olive, this is Kate. There's also Otis, but uh, well, Otis needed a snack. And so I get it, I get it, right? But uh, guys, we're so excited. We're so excited for Austin to be here on the team. God has been preparing him and teaching him. He's done internships, served and helped start children's ministries the last four years four years. You've been a uh, high school teacher at uh, Northside High School teaching math. And I'm like, if you can get kids to pay attention in math, you can get them to pay attention to anything. And so we're really excited for him and his family to join the team. So we wanted you to get to meet them. And if you are in middle school or high school, you can come and hang out with them right after we do this. But I just want to pray over these guys. I mean, this is an important, critical ministry of our church. And we're so glad that God has brought you guys onto our team to help lead it. Let's pray. God, God, uh, I read throughout your word and I see how you are the one who builds the teams. You bring the warriors, you bring the leaders, the priests, the kings to create what you want done in your people. And so God, we believe that you're building the team here, that you're bringing people to serve, you're bringing people to volunteer, you're bringing people to play music and you're bringing people to help invest into our students, God. So we're so grateful for Austin and, and Kate and Olive and Otis and them being a part of what you're doing here at the point. We are praying for you to do even bigger and greater things. It's in your name we pray, amen. Amen, give a hand for these guys. Make sure you stop and say hi to them. And if you're in middle school or high school, you can head back to the, to the fun, wherever that, the, to the, the, the gym, the gym. Where the fun Amen. is, where the fun happens. Y'all want to stand? We're going to worship a little bit more. God is good, and all the time. Yes, He is. And sometimes it's good to just say, "I love you." Let's sing together. Mm -hmm. I love you, Lord. Oh, Your mercy never fails. All my days, I am held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay in my head, I will sing of the. God 
goodness of God. Come on, lift your hands and tell him. After that, I just I want to start us in prayer this morning. Let's pray. God, God, thank you so much for your goodness. That you give goodness, God. That, that, that you you give good gifts to your children. You give your love, God. You are a God of abundance. So God, I pray that we keep our eyes set on things that are above to see your goodness as all around us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to The Point Church. If you are new, my name's TC. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's great to see you today. Where is my spicy second service at? Where's the spicy second? 
There we go. That's what I'm talking about. A little rowdy. Y'all had your caffeine this morning. That's good. That's good. And so today, man, to jump into it, I, you know, I know with the millions of superhero shows that are out there, all the Marvel movies and DC movies, that our culture's feeling a little bit of superhero fatigue. But I still got to tell you, man, I love me a good origin film. Man, I like knowing how the ordinary, unexpected people acquire the superpowers to become larger than life, extraordinary superheroes. Like, where did it come from? Where did their superpowers come from? Like with, with Captain America, it was that super soldier serum, right? He was just, he was TC scrawny, and then he was, but I'm looking for that stuff still. You got the, the Kryptonian uh, genetics and the sunlight making Superman who he is, the, the, the Amazonian super strength and warrior training and Wonder Woman, the, the radioactive spider bite and Spider-Man and just lots of cash for Iron Man and Batman, right? I'm cool with that one too, if that's how I need to become a superhero. All these different guys, there's different things that give them their superpowers. And for me, whenever I was growing up, the thing that gave me superpowers was a pillow. Me and my buddies, we were really into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, all right? And so you know, we, we would play and we would run around, we'd be ninjas, but the way that you got your turtle superpowers was by taking every single throw pillow and couch cushion you could find in the house and shoving them up the back of your shirt so that way you had a turtle shell going on. As soon as you did that, instant reptilian martial arts abilities, guys. And a great place, too, to punch your buddy without getting in trouble. Like, it was great. That's what we did. That's where our superpowers came from. We've been in this series the last several weeks that we're calling Among Lions. We've been wanting to discover where we can find our strength and success in God, even when living in environments that are hostile to what we believe, even when living among lions. And we read these stories of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they seem larger than life. Their faith is so powerful. I mean, they stand up to kings, even in darkness, even in danger, even in this environment that is hostile to what they believe. They have this courage and faith that seems almost superpowered. Where did Daniel get his superpowers from? And so I want to look at that. The first week when we started t studying Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, I told you guys that, that we were going to, spoiler alert, we were eventually going to talk about what I think helped grow that kind of faith and courage in Daniel. And I'll be honest to you guys, what I was going to preach five weeks ago, whenever, or four weeks ago, whenever we started this series, uh, is different now. As I was studying more and more, I was going to give all these different things, add this to your life. And I really think that that unique faith, that powerful, super-powered source in Daniel's life came from one specific place. And we're going to discover that together today in Daniel chapter 6. Say that, Pastor, with me loudly so I know you're awake. We're in Daniel chapter 6. Wonderful, wonderful. So we're in Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. Here we go. It'll be on the screens if you, if you want to follow along there. It says, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom. Now, at this point in our story, we've been talking all the other weeks that the king was a guy named Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. But after Nebuchadnezzar passed, there was another king. He set up his, his, his boy, Belshazzar, as like the regent. And we talked about that last week with Deanna. Belshazzar was a very good king. Overnight, this unstoppable nation of Babylon, this empire, was conquered by the Persians. The Persians overthrew Babylon. And there's a new king there named Darius. Everybody say Darius. And so that's who we're reading about, Darius. He's setting up his, his kingdom the way he wants it with 120 satraps and with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we'll never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So here's what's going on. We got this new kingdom. Persia's taken over, and now Babylon's just, uh, just a, a portion of the greater Persian empire. New king, guy named 
Thank you, someone over here, for following along. Yes, new king guy named Darius, he comes in, and he's restructuring his government, getting in the way at once. This is common, right? New kings come in, and they want to make sure they can trust the people around him so he doesn't get Julius Caesar. So they tend to wipe out all the other people that are there. They have them killed, they have them removed, and he establishes new people into positions that he trusts. And so he, he separates his vast empire and creates 120 different, different states and has a, a satrap or a senator or a governor over each of those regions. And then to keep those guys honest, he makes three officials or administrators that each watch over 40 of those to make sure that the books are right, that they're bringing in the right tribute, all those things. And one of those three guys was Daniel. That's mind blowing. Daniel originally was a Hebrew slave, a captive. And so he's brought to Babylon. You think he would never amount to much, but still his, his character, his gifting, his skills show themselves, and he's promoted within the government, within the, the hierarchy of the Babylonian empire. Well, this isn't the Babylonian empire anymore. They were conquered. This new guy shows up on the scene, and he wants to put people he trusts around him. He wants to put Persians around him that he can rely on, that know his culture. But still, Daniel was so impressive. He worked so hard, he was so sharp, he was so trustworthy that Darius is like, no, I'll keep him around. I want him to look over these other people. And he liked them so much that he's wanting to make them number two. He's wanting to make them vice president of the Babylonian state of Persia. That's a huge deal. And as soon as he's going to do that, all these other dudes are like, mm -mm, no way, man. They, they don't like that. A foreigner in a foreign land getting more opportunity than Persians. And so they start looking for a way to take Daniel down. They must not have read the first five chapters because they know the boys that tangled with Daniel and his friends and their God, it didn't end well for them time after time after time. But these guys, they don't know. They're like, all right, we'll find this guy's got to be crooked somewhere. He can't be that good, right? You always do that when you see somebody that like, you're just like dazzled by them, but you don't like it. Like, well, they, uh, they probably snore in their sleep. Or something like that, right? And you know, they probably like have some like weird like toenail fungus or something. Like we just think things, right, to make ourselves feel better. And they're like, this guy's got to be crooked. And so they start looking because they want to take him out. And they can't find anything. They, they couldn't find. He wasn't selling secrets. He wasn't skimming money. And he was good at his job. They saw as they tried to find grounds to take him out, they discovered that Daniel was a man of integrity. Integrity. Is that the source of Daniel's superpowered faith? I don't believe it is. I think it's critical. We've talked about integrity. It's this idea that your life is fully integrated every form. You're not quarantining. All right, I will love God when I'm at church and whenever I'm about to eat my Pop-Tart in the morning. Like, no, this is like my faith is integrated into everything I am. And so Daniel, it did. He integrated everything he believed into everywhere it was. And because of this, he was a man of character. That's critical. If you want to grow in a relationship with God, it's not going to work just once in one hour on Sunday mornings. You gotta integrate it into your life. But I, I, I don't believe that that is what make, made Daniel's fate so unique and so stand out. But it did give these 120 senators an issue. And they couldn't figure out how to mess them up until they realized the only way we're gonna be able to take them down is if we make conflict between the king and Daniel's beliefs, Daniel's God. And so they go to the king and they butter him out. They're like, hey, king, I was like, you're the best, man. You're awesome. Like, you, you just, you're so good. You're like, you're like, you're the better than the best. You're like the, the, the best ever king. Like, you know, you're even, you're so awesome that you're, you're even better than a lot of these like lame gods that all the people in the kingdom are praying to. And anyway, we moved here to Babylon. They're probably playing to Babylonian gods. You're better than all them. So what if, what if for 30 days, everybody's got to pray to you because you're so much better than anything else they're praying to. And, Dan, and Darius was like, you know what? I am pretty awesome. You are correct. I will sign that. And so they make this rule, this decree that goes out that you got to do, you got to only pray to the king for the next 30 days. And the punishment, see, at this point in time, it was common for ancient kings to make their own little petting zoo. And they'd bring in all these exotic animals from all these different places. And sometimes they'd bring in some deadly animals. And the kings like to occasionally use those for punishment. And they were like, this is the one. Well, the king apparently had some lions hanging out in the backyard. Like, if, if these guys don't pray to the king, we'll throw them out there to the lions to be eaten alive. So the, Daniel 6 is that famous Bible story, Daniel and the lions. And that's what's going on here. They pass this decree. You better pray to Darius or you get eight. And so they publish this decree. They share it with the kingdom. Daniel hears about it. And what does Daniel do? We're in Daniel chapter. Okay, okay, okay. Some of y'all are ready for that. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room. 
where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. So what's Daniel's response to this deadly decree? He went to his room and prayed. I mean, that's bold, that's powerful. He, you see this theme throughout Daniel time and time again when they are faced with conflict, they pray. It's prayer, the source of Daniel's superpowered faith. I definitely think it contributes, but I don't think that's what gives Daniel such a unique faith. Don't get me wrong. I don't wanna say integrity is not important. I'm not saying prayer is not important. If you don't pray, if you don't talk to God, how are you gonna have a relationship with God? If you don't spend time taking to God, your concerns, listening to God, spending time trying to understand what do I say to God? What does God want from me? You cannot grow and be close to God. You can't experience God's power in your life if you're never talking to him. And so obviously he has to pray. We all have to pray, but I don't believe that the prayer in and of itself is the secret to his superpowered strength. Look at the frequency that he prays. How many times a day does it say he prays? Three times a day. And that's an interesting number because in the Old Testament, the law did not require three times a day. Daniel was doing bonus prayers. He was super Christian, right? Like, oh, you pray three times a day, Daniel. Wow, but he did. He would get down every day, three times a day to focus on God, to talk to God. That's, that's incredible routine. That's powerful, a healthy consistency in his life is his consistency, the source of a superpowered faith. You don't want to guess because the answer I'm going to say is no. That's important. You can't have a healthy, growing relationship with anyone without consistency. You can't quarantine. I keep saying it. It can't be Sunday morning, one hour a week in order to have a healthy relationship with God. That's not going to be enough to have a healthy relationship with anybody in your life. you got to have consistency. But I do not believe consistency alone. I do not believe prayer alone. I do not believe integrity alone was the result of Daniel's super faith. I do believe that we read the cause of it, though, here in Daniel 6.10. Three times a day, I got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks. Daniel gave thanks. He was thankful. He's a man with a heart of gratitude. That's what I believe his radioactive spider was, man. I think Daniel's gratitude is what gave him such courage. I mean, it's an interesting thing in and of itself. Daniel is a man of gratitude. I mean, Daniel's circumstances were bleak. He was kidnapped from home as a young child, and then he's growing up, thrust in this dangerous environment, taught things in a pagan world. He's constantly surrounded by people that want him dead. Multiple times his life has been on the line. He's served alongside coworkers that have tried to kill him. He's served kings that have tried to kill him. He should not be grateful. But yet he prays three times a day. And what's he do in that prayer? He gives thanks. I believe that gratitude is what made the difference in Daniel's life. And I think it can make it a difference in our life as well. I believe that gratitude can improve our lives without our circumstances changing. Our gratitude can change everything. Everything. And so today I want to talk about three ways. There's a lot of ways, but just three ways that gratitude improves our lives. You guys ready? Okay, too bad. I'm going to tell you anyways. Three ways. All right. The first way. Everybody give me one. one. The worst way. The first way is that gratitude improves perspective. Gratitude improves perspective. See, Daniel had every excuse to be the most bitter person in the Bible. He didn't have a great life. Right, kidnapped as a child, taken to a dangerous environment. Time after time, his circumstances are dire. He works with people that want him dead. This time, there's a, over 120 guys that are ganging up on him. That's a bad situation. And then here, this decree is shared that if you pray to God, it's going to be over. If I was in this situation, I wouldn't be like, thank you, Jesus. What a great situation I'm in. Man, I would be praying like, God, here we go again. How many times have I honored you? How many times have I obeyed you? I have stuck my life out there. My neck has been on the line time and time again. I have stood for you over and over again. And this time there's 120 guys that want me dead. There's a new king passing another crazy law. At this point in time, Daniel's probably in his 70s or 80s. He's probably, I would be like, God, I'm tired. I've stood for you so many times 
it's time for you to have somebody else do this. That'd be a reasonable thing to pray. We could all understand that. Let's be honest, we've all prayed that before as we've gone through something challenging. But Daniel has a different perspective. Daniel personifies Colossians 3, 2. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Daniel's focus is not on his circumstances. It's on what God has done and what God is doing rather than what everybody else is doing. And Daniel, his prayers, I can only imagine that as he prays these prayers of gratitude for God, as this new deadly dicey decree comes out, I feel like Daniel's going to be like, oh, here they go again, God. Like, can you believe they're trying to take us down again? Like, you remember when they did this last time? Like, my three buddies, they threw them in the fire, and they didn't even get burned because you took care of them. God, like, that's, thank you so much for that. God, you remember, you remember whenever the king had that dream, and he said he was going to kill all of his advisors. He's going to kill me and my friends if we couldn't tell him the dream without us telling without him telling us, but God, you told me the dream. I was able to go to him and blow his mind saying the dream and save everybody's life. Thank you, God, for telling me the dream. God, you remember when you first brought us to Babylon and they told us we had to eat food that we knew would not honor you and you gave us favor with the official and then you gave us strength as we ate the foods that you called us to eat and we were so healthy afterwards that the king made everybody else change their diet to what we were doing. God, look at how you've protected us. Thank you. Thank you for how you've promoted us. Thank you for how you've used us. Thank Thank you for constantly reminding us that there is no enemy, there is no army, there is no king, there is no nation that can overpower you, that God, thank you that you are still in charge. And as Daniel prays this prayer of gratitude, all of a sudden that big problem of Darius, the big problem of all these opposition from sinners, the big problem of the lions, suddenly don't seem as big as is God. See, gratitude is directly proportionate to the size of your God. The amount that you're grateful determines the size of God's activity in your life. I, I wanna try and illustrate this a little bit. I, I, can you welcome my lovely assistant, Pastor Josh, out onto the stage? <laughs> there he is, there he is. See, like I said, the, the gratitude is directly proportionate to the amount of activity that you see God doing in your life. Because a lot of times when we talk to God, what do we talk to God about? When you pray, what do you talk to God about? Your problems, right? That's what I talk to God about because that's what's on my mind. I'm concerned as I pray about the issues and the challenges and the problems of my life, that's what I get focused on. And as I pray about those things, it starts to be a lot more, God, how come you haven't? Why haven't you taken care of this? God, I've got this issue, this problem that I'm struggling with, that I'm facing. When are you going to act on this? Our problems become so much bigger because it seems like there's so many and it doesn't seem like God's doing enough. Pastor Josh, can you give me the, the bucket? This is how so many of our prayers go. Oh, we're going this way. That makes more sense. Yerk. This is how a lot of our prayers go, right? God, God, the, the budgets are tight again. I don't know if we have enough money to take care of this. God, my marriage is strained. We're fighting. I don't know what to do with this. God, my parents are driving me crazy. Oh, can I move out sooner, right? God, I have teenagers. What are, what are those things, right? God, <laughs> God, I, 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 I'm, I'm worried about my health. I'm worried about what the doctors are saying. For me, whenever I pray, man, right now my prayers are like, God, I've got a five-year-old and a one-year-old. What am I supposed to, how am I going to raise them to accept you in a world that doesn't support what we believe as Christ followers? God, I, I, I'm a new pastor at a church. God, how do I grow this church? How do I help people follow after you? God, how do I find enough time to do ministry well and take care of my family well? These are all important prayers. Don't get me wrong. If you're not talking about that stuff to God, then you should. I mean, but a lot of times when we pray, this is all we pray about, if we even pray in the first place. And as we pray more and more about all the challenges in our life, and that's what we focus on, it, God makes a smaller and smaller splash in each and every day. Gratitude shifts the perspective. Whenever we pray and we're grateful to God, we are keeping our minds set on things above, not on things 
that are on earth. When we pray, we're praying, God, thank you so much for what you've got. Remember that I couldn't get to work and you provided that friend at work that's allowing me to carpool with him. God, thank you, you gave me a car. It doesn't have air conditioning, but you also gave me windows that I can roll down. God, thank you for that. God, thank you so much for the people that you've placed in my life. God, thank you for the parents that you've given me that they pay the bills and they drive me to school. God, thank you for the kids that you've given me that, that bring so much joy into my life. God, thank you for giving me the energy that I can put to work. Thank you for giving me a roof that I can sleep under. God, thank you for these things. For me, when I'm praying and I'm making the list of God's done, God, thank you for giving me a wife that's out of my league. I got to marry the woman of my dreams. God, thank you for giving me two adorable, feral children that I love so much. God, thank you for a church that I love. Thank you for the people that you've had invest in my life, the leaders, the mentors that have taught me and stretched me. Thank you for a people at a church that seem like they want me to be there. God, thank you for the times when I was in the hospital time and time again with my kidney problems and pain and you delivered. God, thank you for taking my child out of the NICU when we thought we were gonna lose her. God, thank you for putting food on the table when me and Cody got married and had no money at all. And when you pray more and more with the attitude of gratitude, it shifts your perspective. All of a sudden, all those little problems that once seemed big don't seem quite as big as our God. See, whenever I'm praying with gratitude, I'm looking back on the record of what God has done. You're rethinking that front row now, aren't you? When I look back on the record of what God's done, of how God has provided, I begin to see his power active in my life. God is active in your life, even if you're praying about the problems, but you see it more because you are grateful. You're looking back and finding the evidence of what he has done. And all of a sudden, all those big problems seem small because your God is so big. Your gratitude helps you see the big splash that God is making in your life. It shifts your perspective away from saying, God, I've got all these dishes. I hate doing dishes to, wow, God, that's the result that you gave food on the table. Uh, the lawn that has to be mowed is the result of God blessing you with a home and a yard. The saving up for college is a result of opportunities and better opportunities in your future. The, the, the result of having to change those diapers comes from the adorable little poop factory the guy gave you. That I didn't have house problems before God blessed me with a home. I didn't have car problems before God blessed me with a car. I didn't have boss problems before God blessed me with a job. Whenever we have gratitude in our life, it helps us see that a lot of the mess in our life is the result of how God is blessing your life. We gotta have gratitude to shift our perspective, not keeping our mind focused on things that are on earth, not focused on all the problems and all the barriers and all the issues. We need to address it. We need to talk to God about it. But when we begin our conversation with God with a laundry list of what he's already done, it'll change your perspective on what you are praying for him to do. Gratitude improves your perspective. Everybody give me a two. two. Secondly, gratitude improves your relationship. It improves relationship. A uh, stress researcher, Hans Seal, says that there's two primary emotions that have the greatest impact on your quality of life and your level of stress. Two out of all the emotions that most affect your happiness and contentment. The most harmful one is revenge. This attitude that you are owed something or something's been taken from you. This attitude of they didn't love me the way that I should have been loved. They didn't respect me the way that I deserve. They didn't appreciate me for all the things that I've done. And so your approach to life is that opportunity has been robbed from you. It's been taken from you. You're constantly feeling like you can't reach the level of success because they, they did not give you what you needed to be able to arrive there. You're walking through your life looking over your shoulder because you were let down before. How are they going? going to betray me again. As long as you live in this attitude of what you are owed, a revenge mentality, then your stress will never go away because you'll never have enough. 
But the other end of the spectrum, as Hans Seel was researching stress, he found that the most common factor between people that had minimized or no stress in their life that managed conflict and stress well was that the people that had the best stress management were the people who were most grateful. Happiness is not what helped take care of the stress. It was gratitude. And think in your life, think about the people that, that fill you up the most, that they empower you, you spend time with them and you are energized, they appreciate you, you just, you feel value and you go home at the end of the night looking forward to the next time that you get to hang out with that person. Get, get that person in your mind. Everybody got that person in your mind? I will take from your loud vocal response that you do. <laughs> You're thinking too hard and the mouth doesn't connect apparently. So that person in your mind, now that you got them in your mind, are they good at saying thank you? I mean, you know when somebody's good at saying thank you because they're specific. It feels kind of like they've been like stalking you a little bit so they can find that thing that they can tell you that you're like, you paid attention to that? They're just kind of like, like, oh, thank you. I saw you do that thing over there. Thank you, goodbye. Right? I, I mean, whenever somebody's specific with their gratitude, it makes a difference. I remember this one time when I was working in California one of my coworkers came to me in the morning. They said, TC, thank you so much for how loud you are. And I was like, is this like a sarcastic thing where you're like, please shut up? I said, no, like uh, the, 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 what we do here at this church is challenging. It's a high stress environment. There's a lot of bad days. But every morning I hear you come in, you're either talking in that southern accent, which I was in California. I was the only southerner in the whole place, right? Um, so they, they, they actually introduced me as diversity on the staff. It's like that's the only time someone as pale as me has ever qualified as that, right? But anyway, so they were like, we just love hearing you come in, talking in the morning. We hear you come in, and you sing to yourself in the morning. The whole building can hear it. And I know when I hear you come in the morning, that's just a matter of time before you stop by and ask me about my morning and try and make me laugh. And I need that. Thank you. Man, that was special to me. The point that years later, I still remember that conversation because I felt noticed. I felt significant. We want to be around people that are grateful. And so if you're experiencing some tension or conflict in the relationships of your life, try saying thank you. You know, teenagers, I'm gonna give you this tip, man. You will blow your parents' ever-loving minds if you are grateful and say thank you about something specific so you can show them that you're watching. You better believe we'll let you go hang out with your friends. If your marriage is strained right now, start looking for the things that your spouse does that you appreciate. Shift your perspective onto the things they do that make you feel noticed and loved and say it back to them. Gratitude leaves an impact. It can open doors in relationships. I believe that's what we see. I think that's the reason why all these kings wanted Daniel around was because he was grateful. You can see in Daniel chapter four, at this point, this is when Nebuchadnezzar was still king. He just had another crazy dream. And, and, and once again, they called the magicians and none of them could figure out what the dream meant. I don't know how those dudes had jobs. Never once in the book of Daniel, they get anything right. But anyways, he calls them in, they can't figure it out. And so he brings in Daniel. Now Daniel's the guy that this king was the one that conquered Daniel's nation. This king is the one that put Daniel's life at risk at least one time that we read of. This is the king that tried to kill Daniel's friends in the fiery furnace. And the king tells Daniel this dream and Daniel immediately recognizes that this dream's interpretation is that God was about to punish Nebuchadnezzar, rob him of his sanity and leaving him alone in the wilderness, living like an animal. If I heard that dream and I was Daniel, I'd be like, ha, 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 ha. finally, payback time. God is finally delivering justice to this man. But that's not Daniel's response. Verse 19, Daniel chapter 4, verse 19, it says this. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king, Nebuchadnezzar, said, Belteshazzar, uh, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. So Belteshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. Wow. Wow. As I read that, I see Daniel's concern. I see Daniel's compassion for a man that had taken so much from him. How is that possible? Gratitude. 
The seeds of hate and bitterness cannot grow in a heart of gratitude. And so as I was writing this sermon, uh, you know, I, I was, I've been really convicted this week. I've been saying thank you a lot this week. Um, and one of the things I tried to walk through was what could I say to the people that I'm frustrated with, that I'm thankful for? What could I say to the people that have hurt me that I'm thankful for? It's so much harder to hold on to bitterness when I say thank you. And I think that's what protected Daniel's heart. God protected Daniel from bitterness and rage with his own gratitude. That's why people wanted him around. We want to be around grateful people. So gratitude improves your perspective. It improves your relationships. And thirdly, everybody give me a three. three. Gratitude improves your worship. Gratitude improves your worship, your relationship with God. So I can geek out sometimes when it comes to the etymology of words, like where words began, why we say the words we say, because it's just a, a, a group of noises that we're making, right? Why do we make those noises to mean these things? And so I'm interested in that because it gives you deeper meaning of what the word means. For instance, I'm going to give you an example. Mortgage, right? How many of y'all pay a mortgage? Okay, it's the worst, right? Well, did you know that the root word of the word mortgage is mort? Same place we say mortician. It means death. The word mortgage literally means death pledge, that they're saying like, you're gonna be paying this until you die. Mortgage, changes everything, right? And so the point of all that is, is that I researched the word thank. And thank comes from the Latin word, don't know how to pronounce this, tongere, tongari, tonger, I don't know, however you wanna say it. But the root word here in thank is the word tong. That specifically translates to think. When you say the phrase thank you, that means you are saying, I will remember what you have done for me. That has deeper meaning because I feel like we've trivialized the word thank you, right? We just say it all the time. We say it begrudgingly. Thank you, right? I say it whenever they serve me food at the restaurant. And when I say thank you, I'm not meaning I'm gonna think about this food that you've delivered to me for the rest of my life. No! Right? We just say it so much, but what if we actually did thank, think, remember what God has done for us? If we began to go through the list of how, uh, how God gives us his love and his peace and his patience and his kindness and his goodness and his faithfulness and his purpose and his power and his call and his people. If we go through that list of things that God has done, then it's going to be a lot easier to be grateful. Even in spite, God gives us things, things in spite of us not having earned them at all. My selfishness, my brokenness, it caused the death of God. God's son, and still he loves, still he lavishes, still he unleashes his goodness in our lives, still he grows us. I mean, when I look at the ways that God has delivered me, that God has developed me, that God has disciplined me, that God has stretched me, that God has grown me, then my response is going to be naturally to want to know more, to want to serve more, to want to follow him better, to want to tell other people about him. Whenever we really do take the time to look at the infinite list of all God does, then our response will be genuine, responsive, active gratitude. You know what another word for that is? Worship. That's what worship is. It's not songs that we sing or when we come to church. Worship is my lifestyle that I live out in gratitude of all that God has done and all God will do in my life. I can be grateful in my job. I can be grateful in my school. I can be grateful at any moment in any environment to live the life that God has called me to live because he has done so much for me. When we are grateful, it leads to worship. So how do we, how do we develop gratitude in our life? Well, there's a woman named Barbara Ann Kipfer, and whenever she was a, a teenager, one day, she, I don't know why she started making the list, but she must have been bored in class or something and not paying attention in school. That never happens. And so maybe they were not paying attention in church. I see you. <laughs> Anyways, so she started making this list of things that just made her smile. 
And so she started on this list, and the next day when she was in school and she came across the list, it made her smile, and she liked that. And so she started adding to this list. Every single day, she would add something more to the list when she was on the bus, when she was at lunch, whenever she woke up in the middle of the night and liked the dream that she had. She kept adding to this list. Over the next 20 years, she filled up dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of spiral notebooks until she had enough content to publish a book that she titled 14,000 Things to Be Happy About. What if you started making your own book? You opened up that note app on your phone and titled that note, Things God Has Done for Me. And just start adding to it. When you see something, when you recognize something, keep putting thing after thing on the list of how God has loved and how God has provided, and how God has cared, and how God has stretched, and how God has grown, and how God has developed, and how God has favored your life. And I guarantee you this, that you won't be able to stop because God loves and provides for his people. God made you. God knows what you were made for and the things that you were wired for more than you ever will. Man, I remember growing up in school, in elementary, I got in trouble all the time for talking too much. I'm so grateful that God's taught me to use that for something so much more meaningful. I never knew how much joy I'd find the day that we got Reese, my little guy. It was a new toy and he was scared of the noise it made and how he came waddling as quick as he could to his daddy to feel safe. That was joy I never knew God could give me. See, gratitude, remembering is essential to a healthy relationship with God. Remembering is why we do communion. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it describes communion this way. It says, for I received from the Lord what I pass on to you. The night the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord's Supper, it's not about ritual or religion. It's about reflection. This is not supposed to be a tradition that we do to check off that we're, that we're being godly. It's supposed to be the moment that we stop and remember what God has done for us. And so today we're going to take communion, but I wanna do it a little bit differently than we typically do. Now here in just a moment, the band's gonna start singing. We've got, we've got tables around the room with a little cracker to represent the body, the, the, the bread, a little cup of juice to represent the, the cup. And, and this is supposed to be a reenactment of what Jesus was doing the night before he went and gave his life, before he sacrificed himself so that we could have a relationship with God and we could be rescued and saved from our brokenness and selfishness. And so this is supposed to be something that reenactment is meant to be something that's a tangible way to remember. And so I wanna give us a different way to tangibly remember before we take communion. So I want everybody to get your phone out. Get out your phones, I know you got them, get your phone out. Because if we're supposed to be remembering what God's done for us, I think it's time to start your book. Open your note. And before you get up to grab the elements and return to your seat, I want you to write down three things that you know God has done for you. You can write down about how God gave you that friend in that moment of need. You can write down about how God has given you the gifts and talents that have opened doors for opportunity in your life. You can write down and thank God for a great summer at the lake and for a friend who had a boat. But something that all of us can write down is how his son, Jesus, gave his life sacrifice it all so we can be healed and have a relationship with God. And so I'm gonna pray in just a moment and we're gonna do it differently. Typically, we all take communion together at the same time. And if you're not a Christ follower, you don't, you don't need to feel the pressure to get up or anything. But if you follow God and you spend a little time remembering what God's done for you, and then after you've done that and written down your three things, come, get the bread or the, the cracker, get the juice, go back to your speak and spend a little time thanking God 
gratitude for what he has done as you reenact the greatest gift he's ever given you, that Jesus gave it all. And you can take those in your own time when you feel ready during the song and we'll dismiss you at the end. Let me pray for you, God. God, I often begin my prayers with thank you, but today I wanna say I remember. I remember, God, and so many things. The list goes on and on of how we prayed so desperately and you healed our daughter in the NICU, how we, we prayed so desperately in seasons of hurt and pain, asking what good you can make of it and how you stretched us and growed us, God. I remember times when we, had no, we didn't have any money that we could spend on food and yet we somehow paid our bills. We somehow had food every single night. God, the list goes on and on and on of how you have delivered and how you have prepared. And God, I get so wrapped up on the things that are on this earth. I get wrapped up with the bills. I get wrapped up with the challenges. I get wrapped up with the relationships. And God, I start to get overwhelmed and wonder, are you really there? But when I make the list, when I take the time to remember, I will see that all these problems that seem so big are nothing compared to my big God. So God, let us today, as we reenact communion, take a moment to pause and reflect and remember that our God is in heaven doing so much greater and so much bigger than we could ever ask or imagine. God, let us celebrate you with our gratitude. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Would you stand to your feet at this time? And hey there. Thank you so much for watching and checking us out. Hey, I want you to know we go live every Sunday. So I would love for you to like and subscribe to make sure that we can stay connected together all the time. I'll see you next time. Bye.